It's a fantastic operating library with rare books, and they teach classes here. And, and Victoria, if you're upstairs, thank you. Victoria works 24-7. Thank you for maintaining this marvelous New York City gem. So I just want to give a couple of ground rules on this end for your listening pleasure. Um, the purpose of this isn't talking about a midtown that's mediocre. It's talking about a media, uh, talking about a midtown of excellence. Of how do we come back to that, um, or or go beyond where we were? But this really, when we say world class, we mean world class. There are obviously a range of issues that we're dealing with. The panel that we have is an extraordinary one that comes from, from various segments of the community. And so when you're listening to this, let your mind be open and bring new ideas into it. Not necessarily the ideas that you hear about every night on television or from the elected officials, but ones that really become creative in your mind of, of how we can come back and, and go beyond it. And the second part, is what you individually can do to make a difference. Um, this is the fifth in a series of what we're doing. Uh, as Mark said to me earlier, and, 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 and I think it's great, we're going to try and transcribe it and come out with some kind of uh, report or, or sense of the body uh, in the fall. And then have a working group to move beyond. And we would welcome any of you who want to become part of what we're looking at is an opportunity to really make a difference. So with that, Mark, you want to introduce everybody on the panel just to, you know, 10 okay. seconds for each one. Yeah. I also see that um, Adam Powell, our co-chair of our political action committee, walked in. Thank you, Adam, for your service. And Ahmet Shah, co-chair of our international trade committee. Thank you for your service. I think I see Mohammed Kadur, one of our community partners who runs all county health. And we all know there's a big election coming up, health care, education, transportation. But let's get back to the panel. So we have the special counsel for the MTA, Jeremy Fiegelson. We have the former lieutenant governor when the Pataki was governor, Betsy McCall. We have the Tracy Rillo, who is the, uh, runs the Grand Central Partnership. We also have uh, Rich Taylor, who is the Deputy Chief for NYPD. And we have uh, Joe Rose from Rose Development. So we're going to uh, start by letting everybody do a, a short 90 minute. <laughs> 90 second, two minute intro of who they are and about New York. Uh, I guess we'll start with our special counsel, Jeremy Beagles. Okay, thank you, Howard. Uh, it's very nice to be here. And, uh, you, Howard, for inviting me to this uh, really special evening. I'm going to just, in my 90 seconds to two minutes, start on a sort of an up note. I know the the forum tonight is about rebuilding a world class midtown. I like to think of it more as re envisioning a world class midtown because I'm not going to give up the book, the perception and reality that we aren't still a world-class midtown. This is the world's central business district. Um, this is the place everybody begins their business day around the world. Um, and this is a neighborhood that was very much ahead of the curve on thinking about the future. Uh, and that was primarily seen on the building and development side with the rezoning of East Midtown, which took place in two parts. Um, the Vanderbilt Carter rezoning, which facilitated the building of one Vanderbilt, an amazing new building in the district. And the other is the Greater East Midtown rezoning proposal, which is facilitating six to seven new developments 
seeing at the time that we were a neighborhood that were competing with new neighborhoods like the Far West Side, Long Island City, other hubs of potential commercial activity. Um, but now we are the place and we see post-COVID and post-COVID world what it means to have super class A buildings. That's what's bringing people back when they're back. And we're just dealing with all the challenges of the paradigm of work from home, quality of life issues, which I know we'll get to. Um, but it's really a very exciting time here in Midtown with a lot of work to be done. So I'm happy to be here to discuss that with you. I'm so sorry about that. My fault. The buck stops here. I'm thrilled they gave me an opening. So you jump right in. Very good opening. Should we go to the ladies next? Okay. Uh, former Lieutenant Governor. That's you, McCoy. You are close following us. I'm delighted to be here. Absolutely delighted. And I'm also coming with a very positive message. It doesn't have to be this way. It could be so much better. I took a look at the number of people who voted in the election last November, and here's what I found. The number of people who voted at the polls was smaller than the number of people who voted with their feet by leaving New York over the last three years. Can you imagine? So we all have to get involved. We can't throw in the towel. Now, tonight, since we each have to focus on just one issue, at the beginning at least, I'm going to offer just a few observations about an issue that is troubling Midtown and in fact all five boroughs. No matter how compassionate we are, the migrant shelters are causing a dramatic decline in quality of life in the neighborhoods where they're sited and a real threat to the survival of business and real estate in those neighborhoods. And why is New York the mecca? of migration. Why do so many more migrants come here than anywhere else? Well, there are two reasons. It's not sanctuary city, by the way. One is that there is a consent decree that went way back to 1981. Sorry, 1981, requiring New York to put a roof over the head of anyone who needed it. And over the years, that has evolved to very specific types of shelter, three meals a day, and recently, recently, the mayor agreed with those advocating that New York has to put a roof over the head, three meals a day, laundry service, legal services, health services, and other services to anyone who comes into New York from anywhere in the world. So, are you surprised that they're coming to New York instead of some other city? No. The second reason is that there's something in New York most people may not be aware of. You could call it the Migrant Advocacy Industrial Complex, a huge conglomeration of businesses that are making billions of dollars a year off the expansion of shelters and all the services that are provided, often with no big contracts. And who pays, of course, the taxpayers? And the cost now is up to $5 billion a year, according to the state controller, which is 14% of the payroll of New York City, of what the city shells out for its employees. So you can imagine how many city services are threatened by this huge expense. And I'm going to give you just one example of how amazing this is. Last week, there were many news reports that a new caravan was coming up through Mexico to the U.S.-Mexican border. So the governor of Massachusetts, which also has a shelter requirement, did a 180-degree turn and said, you know, our taxpayers have put so many migrants in hotels and motels in Massachusetts, we can't afford anymore. We're putting a five-day limit on shelters for people who are not Massachusetts residents. 
If you live here and you have domestic violence or a fire or a flood or you got evicted, we'll shelter you for 60 days or more, but not if you just lost, walked across the border. Denver shut, shut its hotel services for migrants as well. In New York, we're going to go on topic at some point. Yeah. The migrant industrial complex proposed instead we will be all time limits on shelters in New York. So I would say, yeah, I would say that in the course of the discussion, I hope we will decide that there are smarter ways to be compassionate for migrants without driving the city bankrupt. Thank you. those realtors that are affected by the uh, industrial uh, complex and the, the, the new paradigm. But let's hear from Joe Rolls because he, he's involved in real estate. Yeah, um, thank you for inviting me to be here. Uh, I was also chair of the planning commission for the city of New York for a decade, chair of the community board for Midtown Manhattan, uh, and run the social services committee for the Platinum and Chelsea Business Improvement District and been deeply involved in Midtown for about 45 years. Uh, good news, very simply, is that all the problems of Midtown, every single one, is completely self-created and met most of the problems in the city of New York are basically self-created. That's not the case for most problems in most cities around the world. New York, Howard was talking about being open to new ideas and new concepts. This, this should not sound like a new idea for most places, but it is for New York. Stop doing stupid stuff. Okay? That's what we basically have to do. And obviously, it's one of our policies in terms of how we're treating the, the migrant situation is not sensible, but there are plenty of other things we do that, that are not sensible, and we have to stop. We know how to do this. It's not rocket science. We don't need grand new uh, uh, visions and plans. You have to enforce the law, and in terms of what's happened, when I became chair of the Planning Commission in 1993, the concern was everyone's going to be on their laptops and ask them doing business, and it's not going to be uh, uh, the, the vitality and the, the economic need for the city of New York is gone, and we got to figure out what to do. That was 1993, the issue. That was a little, it turned out that wasn't in fact the case, though there were uh, deep concerns, but the uh, basic concept is you have to be competitive. New York is the most competitive place in the world, and it's best we have the most competitive people. I take a little issue, I think the people come, people tend not to come to New York because there's social services, they come for economic opportunity, and to compete, and for their better lives for themselves and for their families, and that's a spirit that is important and has to, we have to return to that. From a real estate perspective, obviously, the core, people want to be in New York City and they want to be in Midtown Manhattan. It's the most valuable place in the, uh, one of the most valuable places in the world, one of the most, certainly the most valuable and competitive uh, uh, real estate environment in, uh, in, in the United States. The question is what we do to make it difficult. And there are macro things, you know, tax policy and, and the like, uh, housing policy, we need to allow the private sector to build uh, uh, housing. And if you increase supply, prices will come down. They come down right away. But that's, these are our core issues. In terms of the wonky, now nerdy stuff, that's I think the power wants me to talk about, which is zoning issues relating to uh, uh, office space and office use in, in Midtown Manhattan. Right now, because of the changes that now COVID accelerated what was coming and what we saw and worried about uh, in the beginning of the, of the 90s, but has now happened, is remote work. People have, technology has afforded, and COVID accelerated the uh, adaptation to it, the people working remotely, and as a result, the demand for commercial office space, especially uh, Class B and, and, and lower, Class A minus, has diminished. There are fewer people working uh, fewer hours. They're very high, uh, high levels of productivity but we have a surplus of certain kinds of commercial space in the central business district. So we need to get out of the way and allow the real estate industry, the market, the industry is the, the fingers of an invisible hand, but the, uh, it's the market that will dictate what the appropriate use is, and whether that's a, an office building, you know, and it's not the, it's a bad for developers, it's bad for the city in terms of tax base, but having lower rents for commercial space is not a bad thing 
for the business community in the, uh, in the city of New York. But if the highest and best use from an economic perspective is for a residential conversion or for a hotel, we have to make the legislature allow for the regulatory changes, which have happened both at the city uh, level in terms of zoning and at the state level in terms of coordinating with the multiple uh, dwelling law to allow for the buildings that now exist to be uh, legally converted to alternative uses in a way that doesn't have an adverse impact, uh, uh, adverse financial impact. I don't believe we need to provide tax subsidies for people to do this. If the market wants to do it, get out of the way and let the market uh, achieve that uh, result. Uh, again, not rocket science. Uh, and another thing, uh, lastly, one of the problems is using hotel, hotels in Midtown to house uh, uh, undocumented uh, immigrants is insane. Okay. And further, it takes valuable hotel space off the, uh, off the market in ways that would have a beneficial impact if tourists were in those, uh, those buildings for the use of, uh, of tax dollars. The other thing is the city council has put all sorts of restrictions on zone, not just zoning restrictions and special permit restrictions to apply that, that constrain new hotel or the development or conversion of hotels. And it's done at the behest of the hotel unions that want to have control over the process. The result is it's basically impossible to build new hotel rooms and, and to make a return on investment in terms of creating new hotel space in midtown Manhattan. And these kind of things are just economic suicide. Uh, they're idiotic. They have to stop. They're, they're politically corrupt. And if we don't, if we just stop doing stupid stuff and start enforcing uh, the law in terms of the quality of life, we're all providing compassion and social services. I spend a good portion of my life doing social service work. It's not about not providing services, but it has, we need to be able to be, uh, to do what we know how to do. It's been done before, we should do it again. And uh, people have to so solve the problem. Thank you, Joe. So that takes us to two important aspects, which we're going to hear about now. One is, quality, and they really we, we, we start some introductions. Well, they deal with quality of life. And that's in terms of police and safety, and it has to do with transportation and the MTA. So Mark, what did you pick out? Which of the two? Well, let's just end brief, but uh, none of this would make any, any sense at all if we couldn't get people into the city from all over, and we do have the special counsel for the MTA, Jeremy Fiegelson. Okay, so briefly introduce your background. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, Show of hands, how many people have rode the subway in the last 24 hours? And I keep your hands up. Well, if you're at the bus, and if you paid your fare. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. Uh, uh, many greetings from the MTA. You're the most optimistic public agency no, in New York. We have to be, otherwise we can get up and go to work in the morning. Um, uh, the agenda here is reimagining Midtown, and we believe in that fervently. Uh, we are just a couple of blocks in either direction uh, from the two busiest subway stations in New York City, Grand Central to my right, Times Square to my left. Uh, if you, and we believe fervently that New York can, must, should, will continue to do big things, great things in terms of our public space and our infrastructure. And uh, I will uh, offer you a tip if you haven't done this yet, and you did tonight, kind of right. Uh, walk two blocks, go to Grand Central, go downstairs and have a look at Grand Central Madison, which is the new terminal where the Long Island Railroad now comes into Grand Central. It is an amazing public space. Uh, it is a public space uh, that you, you know, people would say they don't build them like that anymore. Um, and it just opened in the past couple of years. Uh, the usage is off the charts, it's terrific. Um, and uh, it's just a stunning accomplishment uh, by the public sector and private sector in New York working. Um, so I, uh, I emphasize that the flag is that you know, the MTA is the engine that is going to make uh, this reimagining happen. On a good day, these days, we are carrying on the subways alone about 4 million people. Uh, that is up to 70% uh, plus of pre-COVID on a daily basis. So where is the gap? And if we're going to reimagine how we close the gap and then some. Partly it's about the remote work, of course, and I'm going to leave it to others on the panel. Maybe uh, Joe and Fred can fix that. That's uh, 
in the NPA's expertise. Um, and partly it's about public safety and increasing people's uh, sense of safety and their willingness to use public transit. That's what I spend my working days on, uh, dealing with uh, public safety with my partnership with NPD, G. Taylor and his colleagues. Uh, my last conference call before I left with Chief Taylor was with Mike Kemper, who's the Surrogate Chief of the Transit Bureau at the NPD. Um, we are laser focused on public safety, quality of life, addressing homelessness, addressing mental illness, especially in the combination where mental illness and homelessness intersect on the ground in the subway system. That's my main personal mission uh, every day of every week. So we'll talk about that more as we go. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Jeremy. And finally, we saved the best for last our NYPD Blue. We have a Deputy Chief Rich Taylor here. Uh, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Deputy Chief Richard Taylor, NYPD Community Affairs Bureau. Well, Policing the City is a partnership with our, our MTA, as you heard, we just started a uh, weapons detection system on Fulton Street, uh, where we hope to expand that to all major subway uh, entrances across the city, because it's not just important that people are safe, it's also important that people feel safe, whether it's the subways, whether it's the streets, uh, as we get into the discussion more, I'll speak about how we do that as a partnership, and I'll speak about how you are all empowered to have direct contact to the precincts that you see a problem, you see something of uh, a polyamide nature, you can contact your police officers directly, simply, and get the message across to us. So my goal here tonight is that when you leave, you'll have a great understanding of how you can truly, truly address conditions and concerns on your blocks, in your neighborhood, and you can spread that to people who are around you as well. I look forward to the discussion, thank you. You know, a big part of, the, first of all, I want to recognize Thomas Acosta, Thomas, co-chair of uh, New Democratic Dimension, so sitting here in the front row. Um, so the integration of all of this, and we're missing, you know, some pieces, but it really goes to tourism is a big part of the city. As you mentioned, hotels, I think, what is it, 30, 40% of hotel rooms now are taken off the market, really, in terms of what's being used for uh, the, the, the new migrants. Um, safety, we're talking about, when we talk about statistics, there's a sense of things going on in the streets that people feel uncomfortable right now, and that's true of the subways as well. Um, so my question really is, as you've listened to the first round, in your, in, from your perspective, listening to the different people here, what would you pick? What would you take as one thing that was said that you may want to respond to? Is boy, if we could handle this, it would make a big difference. Reimagine it. Uh, we talked about it earlier, even in real estate in, in over Granado, I guess, over in Penn, Penn Station area. They're talking about building a park, building new installations, attractive things for people to come back to the city. What are some of the new ideas? We have congestion pricing with the MTA that's come in, uh, transportation, new alternatives that are possible, bicycles that we've seen more. Um, so what, what, who on the panel wants to go first with a response? I thought this response? is just a broad way, it's such an important part of it. business, no matter what you do, if you're in Midtown, Broadway is part of your game plan. And Broadway revenues are still down about 17% below COVID, before COVID. Broadway isn't doing well yet, even though there's some great shows on Broadway. But people are afraid to come. There's a, just to give you an example of the impact of shelters, there's a big impact, there's a big shelter now open across from the Gershwin Hotel, I mean the Gershwin Theater. So when people come to New York, they're not from New York, they don't expect to see a migrant shelter with all the people, some of them very, I mean, you can't but help but be sympathetic, but they're outside, they're waiting to get in, they have those um, motorized bikes that ride, ride around and threaten the pedestrians and make people feel unsafe walking. And so we really have to handle that. If we want if we want Midtown to thrive, we have to ensure that people who come in from out of town to go to a Broadway show, buy a meal for their, fam for their family, and stay in a hotel, feel safe. 
Thank you, Betsy. What have we learned in the Grand Central area? Because you've had a hands-on and seen a lot of what's taking place here. Well, one thing we've seen is the incredible commitment of owners and businesses here in this neighborhood, and that's a huge, that's a huge impact on the stability in this neighborhood, even though there's a lot of chaos, like, you know, with a small C that's going on around us and lots of changes in how we do business and how we interact with the city that's changed. But the, I can say that the commitment to Midtown East, now, and I want to be clear on this, you know, I, I run the Grand Central Partnership. The geography is limited in the scope of a discussion about Midtown Manhattan. Uh, so my my thoughts about this, my experiences, some of my data points are very specific to this area, particularly in east of where we are today. But we do represent 70 million square feet of commercial space, 280 block faces in the district. Um, the neighborhood is just you know a quarter of a million employees in and out of the city every day, and and so. What we have seen is the incredible commitment. The, 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 no one ran owners, developers, and, and truthfully, most of our businesses did not leave our neighborhood. They sort of buckled down and said, let's figure out how we can continue to keep Midtown East, I keep saying the world's central business district. And the one thing we have learned, and Joe referenced this in his opening, was the idea of, from lessons learned during COVID, how we, how we minimize those properties, in, when you think about re-envisioning Midtown in, in the future, how we minimize the properties that really have no life in them yet? That's the scary thing. Ending up with ghost buildings in our neighborhood is gonna be, that would be the worst thing. So the idea of bringing residential into our commercial districts, we've seen it work downtown, obviously that's always the sort of both the test case and the best example of, of how we intertwine people living in a neighborhood. Our transit system makes Grand Central neighborhood and Midtown East one of the best places to bring residential uh, development into this neighborhood. And Jeremy, I, I want to say, if you mentioned the, uh, Grand Central Madison, we have seen in this neighborhood, in this neighborhood, the bid neighborhood, a 133% increase of people with Long Island zip codes in this neighborhood since the open, if you compare 2022 to 2024. And our weekend activity, this is about the changing city and, and the changing neighborhoods and how people are interacting our, our weekend activity was never big. This was your traditional Monday to Friday community. Um, you know, the idea of programming a Saturday or Sunday in this neighborhood would have been deemed a waste of money. Uh, and now we're doing concerts on the weekend, tours on the weekend. We have a close to one, over 100% increase in long, people from Long Island in this neighborhood on the weekend. Now, are they coming into the neighborhood and then they're walking over to Broadway? Are they having a rest? Are they going to a restaurant here? Our weekend activity is off the charts, so we have to keep changing with that to ensure that the experience in Midtown, particularly Midtown East, is one that people want to keep returning to. And of course, our partnership with the NYPD is a critical component to that. No matter what people feel about what's happening on the street. The data here, we have three precincts that cover some portion of the bid district, Midtown North, South, and the 17th. If you put all the crime from all three precincts together, we represent somewhere around 8% of it. So the, the experience here, this goes to perception versus reality. I think the one thing we can do, and the one thing everyone sort of uh, mentioned in their opening is, we have to deal with the perceptions, while there's certainly realities, everyone mentioned realities,
but we have to do more in dealing with the perceptions to ensure that our Midtown community continues to thrive. Thank you. You had mentioned um, that Long Island visitors are up 100%. And I would imagine that has something to do with uh, Metro North Madison, public transportation. So I think it's appropriate uh, to focus for a few minutes on that uh, because of congestion pricing. The Greater New York Chamber of Commerce did the math and congestion pricing made sense until it didn't. So if congestion pricing was a deterrent to an overcrowded city, and we're trying to bring people in here on the weekend, can we, can we hear about the tariff scheme that was uh, billed as being too high and how are we going to survive funding our mass transportation without that congestion pricing big amount? Anybody can comment on that. Just a quick, quick data point: the 2022 to 2024, an increase of 100% with COVID to not COVID, post COVID. So that's a, the data. We need some some pre 2019 data to post the 2024 data now. 2022 no, to 2022. I'm I, not saying it's, a, it's, it's not great, it's not an important thing, but the data doesn't. I, mostly, I, I, mostly, I, I agree with you completely, but I, I, as I think about it, I, while I'm not sure, most of the data that we use is to compare today, in fact, I'm tired of it, to be perfectly honest, of pre-COVID. So when we talk about before the Long Island Railroad came into Grand Central versus past, I'm not sure if it was 2022 or pre-COVID, but I can certainly confirm that and get that back to you. But I do wish we were living in a world that we stopped talking about everything pre-COVID and post-COVID. I don't see that as being helpful. It's not helpful. We're living in the world we're living in today. There's definitely new ways of doing business. And the idea that we compare every data point to 2019, at some point is just, it's enough for it. That's just my personal take on it. But, and I do it, because people want to know. I just wish it wasn't so in demand to be comparing everything to 2019. Again, we're in a new world and we're doing business a little bit differently and we're, we're, we're building on the, the future and the present. And so it's a little frustrating, but I, I, I believe it is all pre-COVID but I will confirm that and get that information back to you. Well, you know, back to the point of transportation. Uh, so congestion pricing, um, uh, obviously a hot topic. Um, it's the MTA's system to run, and we built it, we installed it, we were ready to flip the switch and turn it on. Um, uh, we are a state agency, we work with the direction of the governor. The governor announced that congestion pricing is indefinitely paused, and therefore it is paused. Uh, our chairman, John Lieber, my boss, uh, has been very clear that he remains supportive of it, that we take the governor at her word that pause means a pause, it doesn't mean cancellation. Um, and the congestion pricing you know, will, in time, uh, you know, be activated. Now, why will we do it? Well, the point is to quickly push reset on this. Um, the immediate goal for the MPA is funding the capital program. Uh, the transportation infrastructure in the city, in the metropolitan area, is terrific, but it's very old. And there are tons of uh, basic maintenance needs uh, that need to be addressed, and there are tons of improvements that desperately need to be made. And I'll mention just as one leading example, accessibility. The system was built in an era when people didn't care about that. Um, and it needs to be uh, retrofitted for an era when we do care about it as we should. So, for example, making every subway station accessible. Congestion pricing is going to pay for that, so that's on pause. Uh, so goal number one is the capital program, and goal number two, I mean, the beauty of congestion pricing as we saw it and see it, uh, was uh, the environmental benefits as well, uh, the reduction in traffic uh, and the improvement in air quality. So uh, congestion pricing is a win-win in that regard, funding the capital program and improving the environment. Um, where does it stand today? Um, as we said in a public session at our board meeting yesterday, uh, we are continuing, we put a lot of the capital program congestion pricing is going to for unpause, but again, operative word there is pause. We expect it to be funded, we expect that we're ultimately to go forward. The governor has talked about finding possible alternative uh, funding sources and he's working with the legislature on that. Uh, 
Um, so the money is going to come in. We are optimistic. We are, uh, again, we'll be optimists. Um, whether it's congestion pricing revenue or something else. The congestion pricing revenue is bondable, so a billion dollars gets us 15 billion uh, to pay for all those improvements and maintenance. Uh, so uh, we expect to see it happen. We are working on the uh, assumption that in time it will. Um, and we are obviously sort of adjusting our sites. And what uh, General Lieber has said uh, publicly about this is that for the short term, we are shifting the focus from improvements like accessibility to basic maintenance to ensure the system remains operable, safe, the lights stay on, and trains keep going on a day to day basis. Uh, so that's the immediate impact. Thank you. And speaking of the governor, I see Debbie Lewis from the governor's office has walked in. Thank you for uh, attending this and thank you for what the governor does. So she I took on mental affairs. So I want to pick up on, on Fred's comment, which I agree, and we used to have as part of the topic here post COVID. Uh, we've dropped that, but I've turned to Joe and, and, and putting on your planning uh, position hat. Um, what would world class Midtown in two minutes mean to you? So, world class Midtown, first of all, it exists. We are world class. We, <laughs> we start off as mid class, we always have been for a, a, a more than a century. And so, there Pretty much nothing in the midtown as a result of having done this for 42 years. I started off as a young man, now I'm old man. Uh, so I have to talk about things. But, but everything from Columbus Circle to Bryant Park to, uh, I love the, the Vanderbilt car, but this is not, we did a lot of great things that enhanced the, the Gallagher Move development from the east side of Midtown to the west side in a way that protected the Broadway theaters, created there. There's lots of great stuff that's done. The core message, though, is quality of life counts. It's important. Obviously, the accessibility, the transit system is the critical thing that allows millions of people to come into Manhattan and the Central Business District and, and be productive. So the, the transit system is essential and critical. But the quality of life, enforcement of quality of life, the perception, telling people, here's the crime data, it's lower, you're, you're less likely to get shot than you think you are, is not, that's not a good uh, approach. Clean, safe streets, uh, and it doesn't have to be in a way that's not compassionate. There's nothing compassionate about let, letting someone uh, wither away on, on the street. Uh, there's nothing uh, required, and I was present working on this stuff when uh, uh, the city signed the consent decree, which was, in, to my view, not. Uh, it may have been necessary at the time to deal with the problem. It was not bad policy. It's not that there's some law that says we have to do this. There's not an infinite number of people. There's not an infinite number of problems. We have to solve the macro problem, but a world-class midtown is one that's safe and clean, and, there, and a lot of important stuff that was done. In the 1980s, the city was extremely prosperous. There was a lot of money being made, but it was pretty squalid in terms of the quality of life on the streets. We had 20 years of rigorous enforcement, cooperation between the, a whole wide range of different sectors to make the, uh, the city, and especially the, 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 the front door, the face, the, the, the most prosperous part of the city, uh, do well. That, sadly, politically, for a variety of reasons, fell off the agenda. People either took it for granted or believed that it was counterproductive or it was, it was a, a bad thing to do to take that quality of life seriously. The result is when you let problems uh, go unaddressed, they metastasize, then you have uh, uh, both uh, politicians, mostly on the legislative side, more than the executive side, but we did have a catastrophic mayor for a while, uh, who just didn't care about these issues. You have to care and you have to deal with this stuff all the time. One of the things, and I'll turn this back to the MTA and the fair beating problem, is it's appalling. Uh, and that's real, in addition to congestion pricing and all this stuff, the fact is there are hundreds, I don't know what the number is, you'll know, hundreds of millions of dollars a year that are being uh, lost because people aren't paying their fares. And it's not just people who are impoverished. I'm sure everybody in this room uh, sees people uh, especially young people, well-dressed, prosperous, they just, you now the, the gates hold up, they, they're in and out through the gate. That's, that kind of behavior cannot be tolerated and, and have a satisfactory transit system that, that functions. You can't do it, the money's not there. 
that, let alone increase revenue things, if you lose, and that's a, that's a tough challenge. So, so it brings up two things. One, Dan Biederman, who you all know, did something that was incredible years ago, and he did a blueprint in terms of the library to UN, in terms of that corridor, and what it could look like, and, and followed through, and it actually hit the blueprint. Uh, it was incredible. The second thing is, is and, and, and you raise it, and it goes to the subway, uh, fair being. Part of it has to be internal, that we've got to get people in the city to feel their sense of responsibility to all of this. It's just not like imposing it on them. It's like letting them think that they're part of a bigger thing. And that's this thing called New York City. And how we get there is, is something, and I'll turn it back to you in terms of fair being. How do we get these people to realize that they, they're invested in the improvement and in, in the betterment of the city, and that this isn't serving all of us? Uh, so, uh, uh, fair being was uh, <coughs> my job before lunch, and then I turned on the season one on the after lunch. So, yes, you can do the right thing to have the information. Um, the number is about 700 million plus a year lost. Um, uh, and that is an aggregate number that includes uh, fare abatement on subways, fare abatement on buses, fare abatement on our commuter rail, people uh, riding in from Scarsdale, and the north not paying too. Uh, and it's uh, people skipping out on tolls. I think the rail so runs nine uh, toll crossings, bridges, and tunnels. And it's got people blocking their license plates and running all kinds of tricks uh, on our uh, camera systems and their license plates. So add it all together, and it's a $700 million hole in the bottom line. What do you bond it? What do you issue bonds at? <laughs> uh, well, a, a billion, a billion. Five percent, yes. Right, so if you take 700, the point is if you do the numbers, that's about $10 billion or more in terms of capital investment. That's uh, well, uh, I'm point taking, actually can't call the fair box, but point taking. Uh, what are we doing about it? So first of all, um, I commend to everybody who reported our group in the panel on the and television, which came out last year, which is a uh, comprehensive look at this problem and a comprehensive set of proposals for how to uh, reduce it, which we are following religiously as a Bible. Um, the, the gist of it is um, that we have to enforce more, but we can't rely on enforcement alone. The problem is simply too big. We could fill uh, Yankee Stadium eight times over number of people every day if we don't pay the fare on the bus. Um, just to support example, the fare evasion rate on the buses is 46%. It's, it's, it's over 40%. Yeah. Uh, there are some very important bus on the bus on the yeah. And subways it's about 14%. And Brad, I feel your pain on pre-COVID versus post-COVID, but it's important here if we look at the numbers that we see is a sharp jump upward. The line goes steeply upward um, during and after the pandemic. There was a culture change. Um, and people of all income levels and demographics suddenly seem to feel it was open season and it was okay money. So um, enforcement, yes, but also driving culture change in uh, getting people to understand that when um, you skip out on the fair, uh, you're not just socking into being gay, you're socking into your neighbors because they're picking up the stuff. Um, and uh, that involves uh, educating our school kids on the importance of uh, using uh, metro cards and omni cards, which we're giving them in September. Um, it involves you know, messaging to New Yorkers all across the metropolitan area to understand why it's so important to pay the fare and that there are consequences if you don't. It also involves, I'm just pricing the capital funding, it involves hardening the infrastructure. One of the things we're most excited about with subways is the prospect of replacing the 100 year old turnstile technology with new uh, motorized plexiglass doors. They're much harder to push open, uh, impossible to climb over and duck under. Um, and uh, funding permitting. Uh, you already see those uh, here and there on the system of beginning to experiment with them. Time locks and emergency gates will deter people from pushing through the fair. The emergency gate is between the superhighway and the fair region. You have to keep it closed. So uh, it's an all of the other approach. I think that one thing New Yorkers should do to ensure that Midtown does better, that quality of life for New Yorkers is better is that they should be demanding from their governments that the money they already provide in taxes and fares be more wisely spent. I look at the city, we have a $114 billion budget, but if you look down at the little items that are spent, and I happen to be more of an expert on the shelter system than some others, so I'll give you an example. 
The city spends $11 on average per meal delivered to a shelter. But the airlines pay companies $4 a meal to deliver meals to the gate at LaGuardia and JFK. Quality meals. Why does New York City have to spend $11 for a packaged meal when American Airlines only has to pay $4? That's money out of your pocket that could be used to provide all kinds of services to those who need them and to businesses and to keep taxes at a reasonable level. You look at the state and it's the same thing. We have a $236 billion budget, right? We have a population about the same size as Florida, theirs is a little bigger, but we spend twice as much per capita. Why is that? Because we're not demanding more. And the fact is that it doesn't sound like a sexy idea, but if we insist that whoever is in government, Republicans and Democrats, they're all the same, they're not doing enough with each dollar we give them. And that's why I opposed congestion pricing, because I thought for people who are driving into the city to go to work or go shopping for their family, they've already paid so much. I don't want to take any more money out of their pockets. Thank you, Betsy. So that comes to another question that Howard and I were talking about, the, the mayor's uh, program, the city of yes. So briefly, because our time's limited tonight, who are we saying yes to? And what are more compassionate ways of helping well, those people we may be saying well, yes to the, who need an alternative? The city of yes, the council had just had lunch with my successor, chair of the planning commission, Dan Rodnick, whose proposal the city of yes is. The city of yes is very simple. As a council, get out of the way of people trying to do good things which is fundamentally provide housing. The good news, and this goes back to the opening point, of that, you know, there's a lot of problems. Our problems are all virtually self-created, but people still want to be here. Young people want to be here uh, for all the reasons. That we're a great place to be. We're all here for a reason. Otherwise, we could be in Florida. Right? Or wherever you can pay less taxes. But it's too expensive. There's simply not enough housing as a result, the housing prices get driven up to a point that actually threatens not just Midtown, but the entire economic viability of, of the city as a whole. If, if there's not enough affordable housing, market rate affordable housing, the market can't provide affordable housing, then we're going to have very, very serious problems because we won't get the talent coming into the city that wants to be here. And the only way to do that at the scale is not with public subsidies, because it's too expensive to provide public subsidies, is to deregulate in a way that's sensible, not tear down landmark buildings, not overwhelm neighborhoods with excessive development. And that's a, you know, that's a, it's easy to say that theoretically, it's hand-to-hand -hand comment when you get into the actual regulation. But the city of Yes is an effort to allow more housing development uh, and the way this affects Midtown, again, is allow for uh, commercial conversions uh, to residential or hotel use, get, get, about, get rid of all this idiotic hotel constraint, which is just you know, to stop using the hotel resources for social service purposes uh, in Midtown Manhattan, because it's just it's, it's eating the seed corn. And uh, you know, the third thing is allow for uh, office buildings that are built at higher FAR, higher floor area ratios than would currently uh, be permitted for residential construction, allow that, uh, the codes and the zoning, to allow these buildings built after 1961 to be converted to residential or, uh, uh, or hotel use. It's not rocket science. Just get out of the way. That's what the city of Yes, for all its you know, description, that's fundamentally the idea behind it. Richie, so what's getting out of the way for you in terms of the officers? And, you know what? And, and, <laughs> what, what, what does it mean? What, what would be, as you look at, at the best world for you to function in the city? Where I remember when I grew up, it was you went to the local police officer if you need help. Yeah. You know? Yeah. How do we get a change in mentality of relationship? that you can do a job better, um, that you can be thrilled about it, and that we can attract more people to become police officers in the city that needs it. Yeah, that's a, a great concept, and my being a police officer, 
Uh, I believe it was the most prestigious thing you can do in New York City. You know, anywhere I go, whether it's a Thanksgiving dinner, a holiday, you know, for some reason I saw you know, the kids, people, adults, they go up to a police officer, they want to talk to a police officer about their responsibilities, about their job, what, what, what they do. So yes, so Howard, like you said, uh, a cop was always a symbol of, of public safety. And with that, so much came with it. Because they do say that to whom much is given, much is expected. You know, a police officer is given uh, a gun, a badge, authority. So, so much is expected from that individual. Unfortunately, one thing in particular years ago, of course, the murder of George Floyd uh, in another state, you know, far, far away from here, caused a tone here that there were riots that carried on in the streets here. It's a different administration. I know that's been addressed here before. It was a different tone. Blocking, blocking up the tunnel, bridges, highways. You really don't see that from this administration. The mayor says that the way New York City goes, goes America. The way America goes, goes the globe. I know the mayor has set a tone that public safety is the prerequisite to prosperity. You know, a lot of people, I hear the mayor, I see the mayor a lot. He says that a lot, a lot. And that's the tone given to the police department. That's a very, very powerful, strong tone. Unfortunately, how to answer your question directly, many, many bills from the legislature, whether it's the city council, whether it's the state legislature, has undermined and hurt the police. It's hurt public safety. It's hurt our, our responsibility to keep people safe, and make sure people feel safe. You know, the mayor has vetoed a couple of bills already that were passed by the city council that certainly hinder a police officer's operation during the day of being out there, of addressing the quality of life concerns. So certainly, many pieces of legislation have been passed that hinder the police. You know, if the legislature was just neutral to public safety, that would really be bad enough. You know, they should really be pro-public safety, helping us. If they're not gonna help us, then be neutral, but to do things to hurt public safety, to hurt our ability to keep people safe, I would say that is, the number one problem we have. And from there, that whole tone is set of, you know, when some kids look at policing, that's not really what it is. It's not prestigious. It's not something they want to do. It's not something to be proud of. For some reason, during the riots, people felt that it wasn't a good thing to be a police officer. I never felt that way. I know the job we do. I know the men and women of the police department from New York, New York City. I see them. I see the work they do. Unfortunately, if a police officer does something wrong, that may very well be on the front page of one of the local papers. But if, they, if a police officer jumps into the East River and saves a child, maybe that would be page 25, somewhere in a corner. Why is that? You know, how many police officers do amazing work day in and day out across the city that unfortunately doesn't get picked up by the media as much as it should, which is why we have our own media, whether it's Twitter, now X, Facebook, Instagram, you know, we, we do amazing programs. You know, the Police Department of Community Affairs Bureau alone, we're doing so much to give back to the community. Just wanted to address two things about that. One, uh, who here has a, that's a, who here has a smartphone, an iPhone? Don't worry, I'm not gonna ask if you pay for it. <laughs> and um, there's an incredible, uh, powerful search tool that you can use on any phone with internet capability. If you just use any search engine to type, who is my NYPD officer? It'll come to a page with a search bar, and the search bar asks for an address. You put in your address. It will show you what precinct you're located in. It'll show you who your neighborhood coordination officers are, up to, down to either their cell number or their email address. In the Midtown North Precinct, the Midtown South Precinct, which I think is, is mostly this area, we call the Midtown North Precinct, Midtown South Precinct, it's uh, the 14th Precinct and the 18th Precinct. We divided both those precincts into five sectors. So we can give as much attention as we can to everyone in that precinct. Each of those five sectors have two police officers dedicated full time to only address quality of life concerns, crime conditions, things like that. They're really not on the radio answering calls for help. They're not answering that one call so much that it's a true emergency. They're really there to come out to your building to see a condition, to make sure that you feel safe. So if you just 
in any search engine, if you type in who is my NYPD officer, you'll see it says search your precinct. You type in the address, and they'll show you again down to the sector. You have two police officers there. We also offer a free crime prevention survey to everyone in the city. Many times there's buildings, there's homes, there's public spaces that there's where there are homeless, homeless condition, drug condition. You can request a free crime prevention survey to any building in the city for free, where a police officer who's trained in crime prevention will come to the location and they'll look around to see how you can best protect that building. Sometimes it's it's cheap, it's just a light. It's putting putting a, a fence, it's very inexpensive. It's fixing something. It's maybe trimming bushes. Maybe people are, are just, you know, used to being somewhere because it's dark. But sometimes just an LED bulb fixes the whole problem. And the reason that we want a police officer who's trained for this is because they have the eye for it. A lot of times, a person who's been living in a location for 10, 15 years doesn't see something with a fresh eye. You need something to, to come, you need someone to come in with a fresh perspective and see how they can help. And Thanks, again, Richard. Yeah, so yeah. So it's great to hear. And we have five minutes because we're going to meet your deadline. Um, I have one to go. So I want to turn to Joe and each of you for one minute in terms of reflections that we should take away from this. this very quick. I want to play the raise your hand game too. How many people here are registered voters in New York State? How many people have regularly voted in state and local primaries? Okay. That is cru crucially important. Not the presidential primary. Presidential primary is important too, but the state legislature, as as uh, uh, the chief was saying, okay, the, the amount of idiotic legislation that uh, politicians are putting forward, supporting, thinking, you know, playing to a con these very small constituencies that don't represent most of what most of the people. Uh, in their districts actually think and experience is critical. So not just you, get your family, get your co co insisting that people participate and that the political uh, system respond to what people actually think is the only way we're going to get the kind of structural change that's necessary to address the kind of issues we're talking about. That's the one that. Okay. Well, I came with one message. It doesn't have to be this way. Life can be better in New York, and yet we are facing a critical situation. As I said, currently we're spending $5 billion a year, according to the State Controller, on helping our migrants to arrive. The cost keeps going up. That's 14% of our city payroll, 14% of what we pay for city employees. It's inevitable that there will be serious cuts in services if we don't get a grip on this. It doesn't mean turning people away, but listen to this. New York City spends 10 times as much per migrant as Los Angeles, the city of angels. We can be angels too. Four times as much as Chicago. We can be compassionate if we provide services but avoid these no bid contracts, these excessive costs. We have to get a grip on this to protect Midtown, to protect quality of life for all of us, and to have a bright future. There have been uh, a lot of comments uh, from uh, across the panel tonight about the sense of safety and where safety and where people feel safer. And we know that statistics don't. Uh, the statistics on crime and suburbs actually are very good. I'm not going to bore you with them. Um, uh, down 11%. Uh, the key we understand is making people feel safe. The single issue we hear the most about from MTA customers is erratic behavior, homelessness, mental illness, and we're laser focused on finding new and better solutions. We want people to know that. Uh, we have a program that we are working on in partnership with uh, the city. Uh, we call it SCOUT. It stands for Subway Control Response Outreach. It's a common if you see a scout on the subway. Uh, we got one this morning. That's the orange and blue. Yeah, the R is a nurse, a psychiatric nurse, who is police officers from our MPA community. And the NYPD has an issue just like this. Too. And they are out there every day uh, looking for people in the subways who are experiencing a toxic combination of homelessness and severe mental illness. We launched this program in October, uh, and just since then we've gotten about 75 people uh, to the hospital, and we've 
great number of people for shelter. A lot of those hospital transports are involuntary, so that only one might be involved people are causing danger to themselves or others and can't care for themselves. A lot of them are involuntary as well. Um, but we are determined uh, to solve that problem, um, not to put band-aids on it, but to put people into a chain of care that ends back in the community with treatment and counseling. And that, um, when we talk about reimagining New York, let's imagine a transit system, and you get on the subway three, three, five years from now, and you are not confronted with those conditions. That would be terrific, and that's our vision. I just want to begin a little out of order. I just really want to acknowledge the work of New York's finest in our city. <laughs> the Midtown community we are, whether East or West, without the work of the NYPD. So I just want to acknowledge that. Um, I will say this too, that the takeaway uh, for me in listening to the comments of the panel, seeing the turnout tonight um, in a full room, there's not a seat left, people are standing. It just reminds us um, of the concern and the interest and the commitment that people have to our city and that we could never write off New York City, ever. Despite all of our challenges, we will always win and succeed. And that's the best, the best thing I've ever had to do. So, wow. Clint, you are amazing. I saw you on uh, Salem Media, and, and you you stole the thunder from Arthur Idala, who won uh, so Lawyer of the Year from the Chamber. <laughs> Speaking of lawyers, we have our Law Center co-chair, Evan Goldberg, please stand up. And standing room only, thank you, Helena Nath, for what you and the staff do every day at the Greater New York Chamber of Commerce. And, and Betsy, I, I want to thank you for our Save the City program. Our foundation is going to get behind you and stand up and be part of that. Because if you listen to these answers, I think we can all agree with a round of applause. We want our city back for the hardworking people who pay the taxes and follow the rules. And I want to do one more acknowledgement. You can see a fellow over here, Sam Davis, who's videoing this, and you'll be able to see it afterwards. It'll be put up on the website when it's ready. And just to make a comment of commitment of somebody, we had a 9 11 event last year in the pool. Just started raining. And we got a little shelter so the speakers could be there. And he stood outside in the rain and videoed the whole thing throughout it. So a great deal of applause for him in terms of his I'd also like to point out, this time went by very quickly. We're gonna have a, a great reception out gated by Sal Mozzarella. And I think, Howard, we're going to do this again September 24th. A little bigger room, the Marriott Marquis Ballroom. And uh, we have a growing list of people. I think Howard said this is our fifth quality of life, reimagining New York, how do we take our city back, and we'd like to invite you all to participate on September 24th in the Marriott Marquis. Uh -huh. yeah.